Health isn't just medicine, it's about shaping a better future for everyone. At UNSW, we're at the pinnacle of medical and health education, with our faculty ranked amongst the best in the world. From clinical practice to public health initiatives, you'll be equipped to innovate in an evolving healthcare environment, including patient care and research, changing the lives of individuals, communities and populations. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our 2024 UNSW Medicine Information Evening. My name is Adrienne Torda and I'm the Interim Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health here at UNSW. I'm joining you online from our Kensington campus here in Sydney. I know we have people joining from all over the globe and I appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight and learn about our medicine program. Tonight we are going to be covering information that's relevant to international applicants for our medicine program. What we'll share is mostly relevant to those who are thinking of applying this year to start in 2025. So if you happen to be a little bit younger or not planning on applying to later, we're still really pleased to have you. Do stay with us, but keep in mind that things do change a little bit year to year. We recommend that you watch future years information sessions as well. Before we get into our session, it's important that we acknowledge country if you're joining us from overseas and you're not familiar with this practice, it's important because this continent that we call Australia is actually home to the oldest continuing living culture of so sovereignty of land that was never ceded. I respectfully acknowledge the Bejigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of this land where I am, on our Kensington campus, which you can see on the screen. I also pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to the First Nations people joining us tonight. UNSW is a university with a really strong reputation. We're a top university worldwide. QS, one of the major respected ranking systems, places us at 19th in the world. Our graduates are some of the most employable out there. The Australian Financial Review has recognised us as the most employable university in the country for five years running. We also have a strong reputation for innovation with more startup founders having studied at UNSW than anywhere else. Our Kensington campus is located in Sydney, just 20 minutes by public transport from the CBD. We are situated in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, home of the famous beaches such as Bondi and Coogee Beach, which is only 10 minutes away. Our university is also in the centre of Australia's lar largest student accommodation precinct, fostering a diverse and vibrant community on and around campus. Our medicine and health faculty specifically also has a really strong reputation. We bring together excellence in teaching and research to address the most significant health challenges the world faces. It's one of the best in the world, also recognised by QS. Our faculty was awarded over $200 million in research funding, contributing over 50% of the research funding for UNSW. Our research is world-class, particularly in areas like cancer, neuroscience, mental health, addiction, infectious diseases, and non-communicable diseases. Our medicine degree that we're talking about tonight has been the most in-demand degree in the state for seven years running. We also have our incredible new Ramwick Health and Innovation Precinct, which is a $1.5 billion project, which joins UNSW up with four hospitals in Ramwick. The building you can see here is the UNSW's new health translation hub, which is currently under construction and is set to be built by 2025. The HTH will integrate health education, training and research with acute healthcare services, delivering better health outcomes to the patients, carers and the New South Wales community. We will be having new teaching spaces for our students that hopefully you will be able to experience when you start with us. In the faculty we know now more than ever that we need a range of health professionals, clinicians and otherwise, to prepare for the future of health. From the epidemic of obesity to global aging and the resurgence of communicable diseases, the critical health issues facing our modern world create numerous and diverse needs that our faculty addresses in order to drive real world change. We're here to talk about the medicine program, but I also wanted to show you some other degrees at UNSW where our graduates are critical 
in driving better health outcomes. In the clinical space, you can study to become an exercise physiologist, a physiotherapist, a dietitian, a pharmacist, or an optometrist. And outside of this, careers like public health, medical, and vision sciences all play key roles too. So I'd encourage you to also consider some of these fields as well when choosing to study in medicine and health. UNSW Medicine and Health aims to develop compassionate innovators and global leaders in health through transformative education and learning experiences. The actions we set in motion here will be felt across Australia's health landscape for years to come. So thank you for joining us online tonight and I hope to see you on campus next year. I will now pass on to Lena from the Future Students team who will take you through the rest of the session. Thank you, Aidy. My name is Lena Caligaros and I'm part of the Future Students team here at UNSW. And I work closely with people who are thinking about studying in medicine and health. We'll be starting off with a program overview, including showing you inside our clinical skills center. You'll then hear the student journey of one of our fifth year students. We'll then get into the admissions process and pathways to studying medicine, which I know you're all keen to hear. And finally, you'll hear from our MedSoc treasurer and another fourth year medicine student around student life and support. Along the way, you can also ask questions through the Microsoft Teams chat. At the end, we'll also have a Q&A session to answer the, these questions, and we also have a few advisors replying in the chat. I'll also mention that the session will be, will be recorded and shared afterwards, and we will add closed captions to that video. That's all from me now. I'm excited to introduce Associate Professor Sean Kennedy. Sean is the Program Authority for the Bachelor of Medical Studies Doctor of Medicine program in the Faculty of Medicine and Health. He's an awarded educator and researcher and plays really a key role in the medicine degrees. Thank you, Lena. Good evening, everyone, or afternoon or morning, whenever you're watching this. Very, I'm very happy to be here today talking to you all, and I want to give you an overview of what studying medicine at the University of New South Wales is, is like and what it's about. Importantly, when you graduate from our six-year program, you'll graduate with a dual degree, with two degrees. There's a Bachelor of Medical Studies and a Doctor of Medicine. And it's really divided into the three, three years. The first three years contribute to the bachelors, and then the MD comes from the second. But the full six years join together. And the way that we have divided up the teaching and learning is into three phases. And the style of learning that you have in each of the phases is slightly different. In phase one, where we've taken most of you straight from high school, you get that introduction to some of the bi biological sciences, biomedical sciences and social sciences, which lay the foundation for working as a doctor. But at the same time that you're learning the sciences, you'll also be learning the clinical skills the communication skills, the physical examination that we use all the time as doctors. And so it's a very integrated course and it's integrated mainly through scenario group teaching. So you're getting real life scenarios about patients, about healthcare situations. And while you're learning it, you, while you're working through the scenarios, you're learning the basic sciences and the clinical sciences. It's also integrated between two years. So for most of the courses, not for the first one in the year, but for the others then, when you're learning, if you're in first year, some of the students in your scenario groups will be in second year. That's the first two years of the program, phase one. Then you move into third year, which is the beginning of phase three. Phase three is much more time spent in the healthcare setting. So during the first two years, you'll spend some time in hospitals, but in year three, you'll spend the majority of your time in health settings, mainly hospitals. And I'll talk more about the teaching hospitals that we have on offer. But at the same time, you'll have lectures, tutorials, uh, lab sessions, where you'll still be going over those basic and clinical sciences, but all the time integrated with clinical learning. The second half of phase two, which is year four, I'll talk more about under the next slide, but that's a very specialized year where you do more research. But once you come back from the research year, 
you go into phase three. And phase three has a bit more of that traditional medical um, teaching where most of it's in hospitals, where you'll be attached to teams and you rotate through various um, different specialties. So you may do eight weeks where you're working in psychiatry and learning about psychiatry. And then the next eight weeks, it'll be in women's health, obstetrics, gynecology, and so forth, over the, so forth over the two years. And then at the end of the sixth year, of course, there are final exams. But we have examinations all the way through, and we have what we call a portfolio that monitors your learning all the way through the six years. So let's go back now to the year four. So year four is an important year where you learn and practice, particularly research skills. That sounds a little bit daunting sometimes for people. They think, well, you know, how do I do research when I'm only a fourth year medical student? But it's a very structured and well-supported year. But it's also a great year for expanding your interests because, because you have the opportunity to choose research projects with research supervisors who are experienced supervisors and researchers from all of our campuses. And you can concentrate on learning how we do research, how we interpret research, how we communicate research. There's two, two arms. Most students will go into the honours that year. So their research project will also be linked with some coursework that they do. And then when they graduate, they'll graduate with a Bachelor of Science Med honours. But other students will also do research that year and it will contribute to the same fourth year learning, but it's as an independent learning project. And there's plenty of help in second and third year to help you choose which path is best for you and which project suits you the best. So that's the six years that you spend at UNSW, but that's only the beginning of your path to being a doctor and whatever type of doctor you end up being. Because in New South Wales and Australia, to get full um, registration, you need to do one year in hospitals, a supervised practice as an intern. And then beyond that, then you go into more vocational training where you'll what we call specialise. Now that specialisation could be in general practice. It could be in one of the many medical or surgical spe specialties or it could be going off into other careers. But for whatever you do, one of the beauties and one of the really things that attra is attractive about medicine as a career is that you never stop learning. Sure, you get past the exams and you don't have to keep doing exams and sitting in lectures all the time, but you always are a learner. And that's one of the really important things that we teach our students during those six years, how to be a lifelong learner. So what are some of those specialisations and careers? So these are most in Australia, mostly run by colleges. And there's College of Physicians, the College of Surgeons. Within the College of Physicians, you can do paediatrics. You can do all of the adult specialties like oncology, gastroenterology, neurology, all those ologies. There's other colleges which oversee training in anaesthetics, in obstetrics and gynaecology emergency medicine, radiology, medical imaging, or pathology. And there's the non-clinical -cl careers where you're not necessarily working all the time with patients, but you're gonna have a massive impact on the health of patients and society in general. Things like public health and medical management, looking after hospitals and making sure hospitals run right, which is not an easy job. Medical research in any of the vast fields of, of research, policy making, and doing, passing more on to the next generation of education. And importantly, you can have a career mainly in medical education or research, but even if you have some of those careers in the top lines, you'll still be doing education and research while you're working as a clinician. Our program, of course, is usually, is, is, is an undergraduate program. You start with a bachelor's degree and we're usually taking students straight from school. We take you through, as we said, a stepwise integration from learning the basic sciences to, to in integrating it with clinical sciences. Also, what you're learning all those six years is how to be a university student, 
because being a student at university is very different to being a student in high school. And then when you graduate, you're finished. You're ready to be registered as a doctor to do that internship. Other universities offer postgraduate programs where you would have had to do a previous graduate, a bachelor's degree in a different specialty, not, in, not a medical degree, maybe a medical science degree. We take a small number of students from our medical sciences degree into medicine, but it's a very small number each year and they enter in our, into our third year. One of the really fun and again, as diverse things about UNSW is that where you learn, we have great opportunities around New South Wales. Where I'm talking from today is at uh, the Kensington campus. And just next door to the Kensington campus, literally across the road, is the Randwick Health Innovation Precinct. And on campus there, we have Prince of Wales Hospital. We have Sydney Children's Hospital. We have the Royal Hospital for Women. These are all world leading hospitals that are providing care across the spectrum from, from birth, from cradle to grave, as we say. Elsewhere in, New, in Sydney, and not very far away, easy to get to by public transport, St Vincent's Hospital, St George Hospital, Sutherland Hospital, the Southwest Sydney campus, which includes the really big, really important, really busy hospitals, Liverpool Hospital, Campbelltown Hospital, Bankstown Hospital, Fairfield Hospital. These are all the hospitals that you'll learn at in Sydney. Our rural students have the potential for starting their first, from first year in Port Macquarie or Wagga Wagga. But the rural students can then beyond phase one, can also be um, do their learning in Coffs Harbour, in, Port, in, um, in Albury, Wodonga, and some of the rotations in Griffith Hospital. And students who aren't via the rural entry scheme will also have the opportunity to spend time in some of these rural areas. So you can see one of the attractive things about UNSW is a lot of the, the campuses are in great spots. So you can have a great uh, extracurricular activities wherever you're based. Some more information will be given about the on-site, about the rural campuses at the days listed on, dates listed on the screen. So I just want to end in closing that medicine, as we said, is the start of a lifetime degree by studying with us. It's a challenge to get into. It'll be challenging to complete the course. It's not easy and we don't make apologies for that. And the selection is sometimes appears really different, difficult, but we don't make apologies for that either because we select students that we think have what it takes to succeed in our course, but also more importantly, have what it takes to go on to be great doctors and really make a difference in the lives of individuals and society as a, as a whole. So I wish you all good luck. And now we'll just go up the other end of our campus, back to the Wallaceworth building where Anna is. Thanks, Sean. My name's Anna and I'm the Faculty Recruitment Officer here in the Faculty of Medicine and Health. And I'm joined here today with two medicine students, Kelly, who's in her fourth year, and Sarup, who's in his third. We're currently in the Clinical Skills Centre here on campus, and this is where Phase 1 students spent a lot of their time. So, Kelly, I'll start off with you. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about what you did in this space? Yeah, absolutely. So, this is our Clinical Skills Centre, where undergraduate first and second year students, so Phase 1 students here at University of Medicine, they get to practice clinical skills in this space. Great. And when you say clinical skills, what does that mean? Yeah, so clinical skills include history taking skills as well as examination skills. And for example, if you're not sure what a cardiovascular exam is, you'll learn that in this space and then you can practice with patients and build your confidence with clinical skills. Wonderful. And how many students are in this space usually? So approximately 20 students in this space, but because there are a lot of mentors and tutors that can help you out, oftentimes students will be split in groups of three to four. So that really helps with providing an experience um, in an environment where they feel supported and they feel like they can be mentored sufficiently. Yeah, great. And who are the tutors? Who are you? So the tutors are often phase three students and phase three, that means year five and six. And these students are often um, ones that come back and want to teach and give back to the community. Are you thinking about coming back? Yeah, absolutely. Teach? I'd love to come back and teach. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so 
So we mentioned patients. Do you interact with real patients in here? So in here, we typically interact with simulated patients. So they're basically volunteers from the public who come down and role play as patients for us to practice our history taking skills as well as clinical examination. Yeah, fabulous. And what was that like the first time you interacted with a patient? It definitely was very nerve wracking the first time I did it because I wasn't very confident about my ability to like elicit information from them and confidently execute my examinations. But as the terms went by, I definitely became a lot more confident. And I felt like that has really transferred well into a hospital setting as well. Yeah, great. And Kelly, although it was a while ago, what was the first interaction like? Can you remember? Yeah, I do agree with Surab. It is a bit nervous the first time that you interact with a patient. But what comes with practice is that you become more confident. And something that's very special about being able to utilize a space like this is the fact that you can build that human connection and build that rapport with patients so that you feel more confident when you're in hospital. Yeah, amazing. And I think that's so great that you do it so early on to prepare you for when you're in Absolutely. hospital. Um, so it's not only important to interact with patients face to face, but we found out of the COVID-19 pandemic, telehealth is, is growing and doctors have to meet patients online. So what do you do, Syrup, in phase one to prepare you for telehealth? So in phase one, we have this platform called the OSPIA, which stands for the Online Simulated Patient Interaction and Assessment Platform, where we managed to book like 15 minute appointments with simulated patients as well. And we basically conduct a history taking session online. Yeah, fabulous. And I can imagine it's very different online to in person. So what are some of the skills you need to have for that? So I think definitely maintaining a, maintaining a certain degree of formality is important because you're doing it out of the comfort of your own home. So you tend to lose track sometimes. And it's a lot harder to pick up on nonverbal cues such as body language on an online platform because you can't really read these things when you're not in the same room as the person. But over time, you definitely get used to it. And it also allows you to improve on your history taking skills significantly because you don't have the opportunity to rely on these nonverbal cues. So I think it's definitely been a useful tool for my learning. Yeah, great. And since you can do it from home, how do you get feedback on what you've done? So the platform has an inbuilt feedback system where uh, we input our own reflections on a session as well as the patient who would input their feedback and gradings of how we perform during the session as well. No way, so you hear from the patient about how you did. Yes, we do. And it's especially very helpful because it's very useful feedback that we get from them and we can always take that feedback and apply it into our subsequent sessions in the future. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so I know that first year students in our program are also given opportunity to interact with people in the community. Um, so Kelly, can you talk a bit more about that? Absolutely. So in our first year, we're given the opportunity to speak with mothers who um, have gone through the experience of pregnancy and giving birth. And that allows us to learn those lived experiences of those members in the community. So they'll come online. Um, it's a session called Bumps and Bundles. And they talk to us about their experience and we can learn what it's like to be a new mother and learn all those intricacies that we might not get if we didn't have that session. Yeah, great. And I think that's great interacting with them before they become patients in a hospital as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wonderful. So as Sean already mentioned, phase one students um, don't just learn clinical skills on campus. We also go into hospital um, very early on. So Kelly, how often were you in hospital in your phase one? Yeah, absolutely. So in our phase one, which is our first year and second year, we are at hospital approximately once a fortnight. And essentially that alternates with our sessions here at the Clinical Skills Centre. So oftentimes you'll have a Clinical Skills Centre um, session and then you'll learn and apply that skill to hospital the next week. So that system really allows you to learn from a very early stage how to be a better clinician. Yeah, amazing. I can definitely see um, how that could help you uh, going into hospital and then you can go and chat about those experiences in the Clinical Skills Centre exactly. with the students. Um, so, Sarup, I know you're in the start of your third year, so you just finished phase one. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about the rotation, clinical um, rotation that you're on now yep. and how the skills you've learned in the centre have helped with that? Yeah, so currently I'm in my obstetrics and gynaecology rotation at the St. George Hospital. So in terms of how the skills I've learned here have helped, you know, with all the experience I've accumulated throughout phase one, practicing in the clinical skills center repeatedly, running through history taking skills and clinical examinations, I've developed a certain degree of confidence in being able to perform them. And I think that has really reflected uh, well on me in terms of my performance in the hospital setting as well, because I feel significantly more adept now. Yeah, fabulous. And Kelly, you just finished your third year. So can you tell us about the different rotations you went on and what was your favorite? So some of the really great aspects of third year at UNIS Medicine is the fact that we get to rotate through so many different specialties. So we go through 
six specialties during the whole year. Some of my favorites included obstetrics and gynecology because we were actually able to interact with the mothers and for example, look at the fetal heart rate and monitor that on the patients. So being able to have that hands-on experience I thought was so valuable. But some of the other ones that we went through included cardiology, respiratory, palliative care. So we do really get a taste of everything and I think it's so great to be able to see potentially what you might want to do and specialize in in the future. Yeah, amazing. Um, so it sounds like, Sarup, you have a good year to look yeah. forward to, um, a lot of different rotations. So thank you both for joining me today. It was so fantastic to hear about how early clinical experiences start in the medicine program. And I'm sure that everyone watching from home also found this session useful. So thank you once again, and we'll throw back over to you, Lena. Thanks, Sean and Anna, for taking us through the detail of our medicine degree and going into detail about the clinical exposure in our program. Now that you have an insight about the clinical experience our students get, I'm going to pass over to Janice, who is one of our Phase 3 international students from Hong Kong. She will take you through her journey from applying to studying at UNSW. Thanks, Lena. Hi, everyone. I'm Janice from Hong Kong, and I'm currently a fifth-year medical student at UNSW. Today, I will share my journey from applying to being in my final phase of the medicine program and what I have gotten up to as an international medical student. So medicine has always been something that I wanted to pursue since high school. At the same time, I wanted to complete my tertiary education overseas, mainly to experience a change in lifestyle and culture. I was debating between studying in the United Kingdom or Australia. But weather plays a big factor in my mood, so the forever gloomy weather in the UK was not for me. I chose to look at the universities in Australia because you get to enjoy a lot more sunny days and a warmer winter. So why did I choose UNSW out of other medical schools in Australia? So UNSW caught my attention because of its unique year of research. I had no idea if I wanted to, I would enjoy research at the time, but I thought it would be cool to do some research while in uni before deciding on which medical specialty I would go into. In addition, there were a few seniors in my high school who were doing medicine at UNSW when I was still unsure which one to go with. But they all gave positive feedback to the teaching quality and I'd have to say friends do make an impact. I then decided to go through the application process and here I am. So I started off with a pretty special learning environment since my phase one was during the COVID-19 pandemic. The faculty supported us by making the live lecture online. And also now there are more online resources available for future students because a lot of teaching materials were converted during COVID. The best part of phase one for me was the clinical skills sessions and online hospital sessions, which took place in alternate weeks. That was when I started first time how to take a proper medical history with a real doctor. The doctors were able to provide feedback and tell you which questions were important and relevant when making a diagnosis. We had to get comfortable with history taking. So my peers and I met online to practice all the time and learn together while we were in lockdown. My third year was a mix of campus-based teaching and hospital learnings. My clinical placement mainly have been at the Prince of Wales Hospital, which was one of the main hospitals in Sydney and just only across the road from the UNSW campus. The hospital rotations are very valuable. This was the best time to practice my clinical skills on real patients. I remembered so clearly the first time I ever listened to a patient's heartbeat instead of my peers. The patient had a heart murmur. And the doctor I was with went through the basic concepts on heart murmurs, which I would now always remember. And the photo on the left is my lovely study group where we had regular study sessions to consolidate our science fundamentals and also to practice our clinical skills. Year 4 is the exciting research year. You spend most of your time on your project, but students can also complete some extra classes. I completed an advanced course on facializing diseases where I learned about the cutting edge development of microscopes. I did my research project at the emergency department at St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, which is another hospital affiliated with UNSW. My research project looked at a newly developed device that measures troponin levels. So troponin is a protein that is found in the cells of your heart muscles. And when there are high levels of troponin in blood, it usually means that someone has had a heart attack. So currently the laboratory takes about one to two hours for the result to come back, 
but with this new testing device shown on the slide, the results can be given in like 8 minutes. This sounds so much quicker, right? But before the device can be put into clinical use, researchers have to test how accurate and suitable it is. So I performed some tests on this device in the laboratory and also learned how to write scientific reports, which is a fundamental technique required in all fields of medicine. So phase three are the last two years of the medicine program and is where you spend all weekdays in hospital. We get to rotate across different disciplines like surgery, medicine, and general practice. While there is a continuous practice of history taking and also physical examination skills, there is now a stronger focus on how to manage or treat the patients. Right now, I'm in the fifth year and I've just finished my rotation in obstetrics and gynecology, which is women's health. So it includes pregnancy care and the delivery of babies, as well as other issues commonly faced by women like menopause, contraception and cervical cancer. I get to see patients from ages ranging from teens up to elderly, and they present with very different issues. In the antenatal, antenatal clinic, some women may have no issues when they are just pregnant and here for a visit of a regular check, while someone may have underlying issues like diabetes, genetic conditions, and other chronic conditions. I came into my rotation not knowing a lot, but this medical sh not knowing not knowing a lot about these medical conditions, but I ended up learning a lot about treatment approaches for different patients, which is what the rotations are all about. I have just moved on to my pediatrics rotation, so I'm seeing a lot of children and sometimes babies, but I can't go into too much detail since I just started. There are also opportunities to. Yep, there are also opportunities to attend conferences as a student. So recently, I, successful, I, su I was successfully received a grant from the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia to attend the Pathology Update 2024 Answers in Adelaide conferences. So I attended the event as, at the start of the month, and the conference gave me amazing exposure to the current research topics within the field of pathology, with loads of opportunities to meet doctors, pathologists, and researchers from all over the world. Overall, being an international student and doing medicine at UNSW has been an incredible experience. Outside of building your medical knowledge, you make some really close friends. Not only will they be your study partners that you go to classes with, but also friends who help maintain your work-life balance. My work-life balance includes going on road trips to see the amazing scenery of regional New South Wales, and when I have longer breaks, I travel interstate and explore all of the Australia. This is something that you will you could do when you come to UNSW as an international student. Thanks for joining me on my journey to UNSW. I hope it was helpful to see what it is like to be an international student, and I hope to see you all soon. Now I will pass the time back to Lena. Thank you very much for sharing your journey, Janice. Now that we know more about the degree, we're going to get into how you apply to medicine at UNSW. I will take you through the admissions process, including our interviews and the English language requirements. As mentioned earlier, this application process is for the international applicants only. If you are a domestic applicant, our admission process varies and we recommend you watch the recording of our 2024 Domestic Medicine Information Evening, which you can find on YouTube. For international students completing the IB or an Australian qualification, there are four steps to applying to medicine. One, sit the admissions test, so UNSW accepts either the ISAT exam or the University Clinical Aptitude Test for Australia and New Zealand, the UK ANZ. Two, apply to UNSW through the medicine application portal, the MAP. And three, submit your application and preferences to the University Admissions Centre, UAC International. And four, complete an interview if selected. For international students completing other qualifications to the IB or an Australian qualification, for example, if you're completing the Hong Kong DSC or the GCE A-levels, you apply through a different portal. There are three steps you will take. The first is sit an admissions test, so either the ISAT or the UCAT ANZ. Two, apply to UNSW Apply Online. And three, complete an interview if selected. Make sure you note the dates. You will need to sit an admissions test early enough that your results are available by, no, no, by November. This is also the deadline to have your completed applications, but we recommend doing these steps as early as possible so you can get your offer early. 
There are three selection criteria for you to get an offer, your academic merit, admission test result and interview. Now let's get into these steps a little bit more. Like any applicant, we also consider academic merit in your application. In 2024, they were the minimum entry requirements to be considered for an interview, which can give you an indication of what might be required for the 2025 entry. So IB students need a minimum of 38, GCE A-levels a minimum of 17, Hong Kong DSE is a minimum of 27, and SATs a minimum of 1370. The Australian Tertiary Admissions Rank equivalent is 96, and for any foundation students, your GPA will be 9. Now let's look at the admissions test. As we said, international students are able to apply with either the UK ANZ or the ISAT. These median and lowest admission test scores from 2024 will give you an idea of what you will need to aim for. The UK ANZ, the median score was in the 84th percentile and the lowest was in the 51st percentile. Applicants need to reach at least 50th percentile to be considered for interviews. The ISAT median was 178 with the lowest at 165. So applications need to reach, applicants need to reach at least a 165 ISAT score to be considered eligible for interviews. If you are planning on sitting both tests, you will need to hold off your submitting your application until you have received both results and you know which one is the best score. Once submitted, applicants can no longer change their test result. All inter international applicants can apply through Apply Online. On top of providing your academic results, you will need to complete two additional steps in the application. One, download and complete a form, confirming registration on the ISAT or the UCAT, including the registration number, and upload this into the application. Two, download and complete a form with life experience questions called the Medicine Personal Statement, and upload this onto the application. Now let's look at the final selection criteria, the interviews. Interviews for international applicants are held online via Zoom. Our medicine interviews are intended to get to you to know a person. They are structured interview over a limited time. There are two interviewees on a panel. Interview coaching for the interview is not recommended and is easily detected and, we may, and may be detrimental to, to your performance. There are also no trick questions. Just be honest if you want to do your best. Receiving an interview is competitive. For 2024, we received 618 applications and were able to interview 334 of them. Interviews are held monthly starting in May and will continue throughout the year until all places are filled. We also have minimum English language requirements. The IELTS score is 7.0 overall with a minimum of 6 in each subband. TFL is 94 overall with a minimum of 25 in writing and 23 in reading, listening and speaking. You can find other English language test requirements online. Getting into medicine is a competitive process, but if you're determined, it shouldn't be a question of if you're going to get in, but when. Now I'll pass on to Sarah and Sarup, who are currently inside one of our study spaces in the medicine building, and they will talk a bit more about MedSoc, our medicine society at UNSW, as well as some of the student experiences and support services that we have for our international students. Thank you, Lena. Hi, my name is Sarah. I am a fourth year medical student. I am the MedSoc treasurer, and I am also an international student from Singapore. Hi, my name is Surup, and I'm a third year medical student also from Singapore. So today we will be talking about student life in UNSW, as well as providing support opportunities um, that are available for international students. So starting off with MedSoc, which is our medical society. So MedSoc is one of the biggest societies in UNSW, comprising of students from first year all the way to sixth year. And um, we do have, we organize events such from academic to social events. So for example, our peer tutoring uh, um, for first years, and we do have like med camp and med ball. So we also do have special interest groups such as surgical society, um, internal medicine society, um, where students get to express their and pursue their interests in, within medicine, as well as med show, and Medical Music Society where they get to express themselves and explore their passions outside of medicine. So Sir, what are the best med uh, med events that you've been part of? I think med camp was definitely one of my favorite ones, largely because I got to meet my entire cohort at one go. And I think that's a unique opportunity that I haven't really had ever since then. 
So it was really nice, you know, it was early on and I got to meet so many new faces and just acquaint myself with my cohort pretty well. The same thing could be said for Medball as well, where I met a lot of people from my cohort once again. I also got to meet students from other cohorts as well, which was really nice to like get a chat with some of my seniors as well. I think the MedSoc tutorials that happen every term as well were really helpful for me too, in terms of like helping me prepare for exams. So yeah, I'm looking forward to some of those as well. And can you tell me more about the international MedSocs? Yep, so we have a Singapore Medical Society as well, which pretty much similar to MedSoc, also organizes uh, tutorials, academic tutorials for preparations like towards exams. And they also organize a lot of networking events as well, where we get to meet doctors from Singapore who tell us about their journey and their career pathways and educate us more about the steps we need to take should we choose to go back and practice. Yeah. And do you have any other societies outside of medicine? Yes. So I'm part of the Lo-Fi Society and Calisthenics Society as well, which fulfills like my interest in music and fitness respectively. And they organize a bunch of events where we get to meet up and, you know, like work on our passion together. I think it's really good also because it allows me to meet students from other degrees as well and other programs and it really offers me an alternate perspective of, on what university is like for them. I think other events such as like Stress Less Week has been really good as well where they bring in like dogs and alpacas for us to pet and they organize like late night snacks and early breakfast for us to, like closer to exam periods just to take our mind off of studying a little bit. All week was also like a highlight event for me because as an international student coming into Australia for the first time, it felt very daunting, but I was welcomed by a bunch of like happy faces and just being exposed to all the societies that are available in UNSW really helped me settle in. Yeah, a week is always the highlight of the freshers, yeah. So now let's talk about the day-to-day -day life of a UNSW medical yeah. student. So how is your year looking like? So since I'm in phase two in my third year, uh, most of my time is actually spent in the hospital. So I'm in the hospital three days a week and I'm on campus two days a week. So on campus is mainly just like lectures and tutorials and hospital is where I get majority of my clinical exposure. This was pretty different to what I experienced in the first two years because the first two years was more like theoretical based where I was covering an organ system and I was learning all the basic medical disciplines surrounding it like anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, etc. And th that knowledge was initially being applied to theoretical cases in like scenario group sessions. But now the learning is a lot more applied when I'm using what I've learned in phase one and applying it to real patients in actual clinical settings. And can you tell me a bit about like the learning style in phase one? In phase one, it's very much just like lectures that happen, you know, like whole cohort lectures. And then on top of that, we have like practicals and labs where we get to learn a little bit more about the content that we've covered in lectures. And then we have like our scenario group sessions where we get together in a small classroom and we discuss some of the knowledge that we've learned and how they can be applied to some theoretical medical cases. And I think the question that everyone wants to know is how much do you actually study? So I'm someone that likes to study things sooner rather than like leaving it to the last minute. So I try my best to dedicate about an hour and a half or two to studying new content and revising old content every day. Yeah, you sound like the perfect student. <laughs> yeah, so for me, I'm currently in fourth year completing my independent learning project. Yeah. Um, it's on oncology. And so my year looks kind of different from first to third year. Yeah. Um, I'm mainly in hospital working with my supervisor. It's yeah. pretty self-directed. I don't have a lot of classes, yeah. but what I'm doing is, at least for my project, is more like data collection. Yeah. And I get to meet a lot of doctors and learn about like, the different re uh, research styles and get, learn, get a lot of research opportunities mm. that you, others would be learning outside of med school, mm. which I think is a really unique um, program that UNSW Medicine offers. Yeah. Um, so do you know what you're going to do next year? Or? Uh, I haven't really made much of a decision yet, but I am looking forward to figuring it out soon. So yeah, just something to look forward to. Yeah. Sounds good. So I know that after listening to all this, med medicine program sounds like it's really challenging, yeah. but it's also really, really rewarding. Yeah. And there are really great support services that help us get um, help get us through the yeah. year. Yeah, so of course there are MedSoc events um, where they prepare us for career opportunities outside of um, med school. Yeah. So for example, finding our an internship. Yeah. Whether we want to stay in Australia or go back, you know. Yeah. And as you said, stress less week. Yeah. And we also do have like 
um, support services for psychological and wellness. Yeah. So we do have hotlines and yeah. our faculty is always happy to help whenever we have um, we are in distress or we have problems coping with the medical program. Yeah, and I think especially for me as someone who's like lived on campus, I think like the in-house accommodation and like the college life here had like really well implemented support systems as well. Yeah. And people I could always go to should I ever like require help. So that was really helpful for me as well, especially coming in as an international student. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's all the time we have today. Thank you for speaking with me, sir. Yep. And uh, thank you. It was really nice. It was a pleasure. And yeah, we'd like to pass our time back to Lena. Thanks, Sarah and Sarup. It's always exciting to hear about MedSoc and just how much students can get up, get up to outside the classroom. And what you've spoken about barely scratches the surface. Now we're going to move into the Q&A. We have lots of questions in the chat and won't be able to get through them all. So please thumbs up any questions you want to hear answered so we can get to those first. Like I said earlier, anything we go, don't get to tonight, our future student advisors are always happy to answer at any time. Thanks, Lena. And thank you, Sean, Sarah and Arnie for joining us today um, for the Q&A. So we've had a lot of questions come through tonight and we'll try to get through as many as we can in this session. So the first one I'm going to throw to you, Sean, we're getting a lot of questions about the interviews. And can you tell us what do we look for in the interview? Are there any medical questions as well? Yeah, thank you, Anna. There are absolutely no medical questions or expected knowledge in the interview. The interview is standardised and everyone gets asked a similar set of questions, but they're all the questions are to find out a little bit more about you, uh, why you're wanting to do medicine, what your previous experiences are like, and a little bit about you as a person. Yeah, great. And Arnie, having taken an interview to get in, yeah. do you have any advice for the students? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the biggest thing, I think as Sean has mentioned, the interview really felt like a conversation. They just really want to know um, more about you, your experiences, what makes you tick. So the, the best thing to do really is to sort of talk about who you are, your personality, and try and link the experiences that you've had into who you've become. Yeah. Yeah, great. Great advice. Um, now we're getting quite a lot of questions around, do you sit the UCAT ANZ or do you sit the ISAT? So Sarah, I'm going to throw this one to you. Which one's better to sit? That's a very good question. So I personally took both just because some school wanted the UCAT, some people, um, some schools wanted the ISAT. Um, just a baseline knowledge um, kind of context is the ISAT is a three hour exam based on two components. And then the UCAT is a five section, two hour long paper. And I think that um, both are equally challenging. I did, I personally did better in the ISAT. Um, but do note that whatever you choose to take or you choose to take both, it will, it will co um, be considered in terms of your application and together with your high school scores and your interview scores, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, perfect. And as we mentioned now, um, for those applying through the UNSW Apply Online portal, um, you can definitely sit both. You just have to pick whichever's higher. So using those median and lowest scores that we that we showed for last year will help you decide which one would be better to use to apply with. All right. So Sean, one for you. What happens if you don't pass exams while studying? Okay, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> um, one of the things about medicine and I was of course a medical student once as well uh, for us as medical students is sometimes to realize that we're not always going to be the top of the class we're not always going to get high distinctions and sometimes we won't pass won't get a pass mark in an assessment whether it's an assignment or an exam um, but of course it's not one strike and you're out what we don't set out, write the questions in order to pass, to fail students. We do expect all students to be able to pass. And so if they haven't passed on one exam, then you get another opportunity. Now, sometimes that opportunity will be soon after. Sometimes it might be a bit of delay with some extra learning, but it's there's always an opportunity to reset. Yeah, it's great that there, there is that opportunity for, yeah. for additional, um, yeah, additional tries. Additional learning yeah. and really to give you the opportunity to show what you can do. 
Yeah, fabulous. Um, so we have a few quick admissions um, questions. So does UNSW accept predicted grades? Um, no, we don't. Uh, so you have to have finished your high school results. And then once you have those, then you can apply. So it sort of goes along with another question we have around, is it better to sit the interview earlier in the year? Um, yes, it is. We recommend sitting it as early as you can, as soon as you get your high school results and if you have the ISAT or UK ANZ results. Um, but yeah, you won't be able to apply with predicted results. So it'll be once you've finished um, high school. All right. So we have um, a question for our students here on the panel. So we'll start off with Arnie. But how did you know you wanted to study medicine? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> so I always enjoyed I'll considered medicine as a career I've always enjoyed like the um the, the puzzle that you have to solve enjoyed working with your hands but it took me a while to reach where I am I actually pursued economics before I did medicine so even though I had the privilege of actually being a medic where I got to see different levels of healthcare, I still wasn't a hundred percent convinced that medicine was the right fit for me it's only after I put to something else when I really realized how much I enjoyed the problem solving nature, the working with your hands, the ability to speak to people, um, you know, the interaction, the human interaction that comes in. So I think it took a lot of learning opportunities at a different point of my life to really figure out that medicine was for me. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. And it's great that you did try out something different yeah. and it made you realize that you actually wanted medicine. Yeah. Um, all right. And Sarah, what made you study medicine? I think similarly to Ani, um, I've always wanted to, to do medicine. But for, for me personally, it was a lot of personal health problems when I was young and as a kid. And getting to interact with the doctors, the nurses, and seeing how kind they are, the personal interactions we've had. And it really made me interested in the healthcare, um, career in the healthcare. But um, what made me really want to do medicine was also a personal anecdote, but um, my grandfather, you know, had a stroke and... I, w I, you know, I really wanted to do something, but I had no knowledge of it. So I really wanted to pursue it so I could, you know, help others that I love, help people in general. And yeah, and that's really why I wanted to do medicine. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, yeah. Sarah. Um, and it's great that you're almost finished yeah. <laughs> through your program now and that you're here. Um, all right. So, Sean, we touched on this earlier tonight, but what um, are the different career opportunities for students studying medicine and do they always end up in a clinical space? Yeah. The, one, one of the great things about studying medicine is that when you graduate, you can almost choose your adventure afterwards. And... Uh, Many, most of us, most of our graduates will work clinically, whether in primary care, in hospitals. If you're an international student, that may mean that you stay and work in Australia or maybe going back home or to another country to continue your work there. But then there's plenty of opportunities to, to take on other careers, whether it's in research, whether it's in education, whether it's in policy development or public health. and. Uh, as we've all seen over the last few years with the pandemic, it's been the public health physicians who in some ways are not clinical necessarily, but they're great medical graduates. They're the ones that have really made the big difference and, and, and guided us all through the pandemic around the world. Yeah, great. Um, so we're getting a few questions coming through around accommodation options for international students. Um, Sarah, could you tell us a bit about your experience living on campus? So currently I am living at um, UNSW Terraces and so is Ani. So Terraces is just an, um, an apartment for students and you have a very independent kind of learning, um, sorry, living condition. But there are other options such as the colleges, such as Big Tree, International House and Colombo. And those are a bit more social. You get to meet more people and there are many events that will help you meet new people um, and grow as a person, especially finding your family outside from your own family, which, uh, which are far away. And I think that wherever you choose to stay, there's always a community for you. Um, and yeah, I think that there's always somewhere to live on campus or outside of campus, whatever suits your living style and preferences. 
Yeah, great. And it's great that you and Arnie live in the <laughs> yeah. same building yeah. as well. Um, all right, a few more admissions questions. Um, so how many places are there in the medicine program? So for international students, we hold approximately 100 places per intake per year. Um, so, yeah, about 100 there. And then we have about 200 domestic. So one third of our cohort is international students. Um Question about what subjects do I have to study in high school? Um, so as we mentioned, there are no prerequisites at UNSW. We only have assumed knowledge. And so that means that academics, when you come into your first year, will assume you have a level of knowledge. For us, it's a, a level high enough of English for you um, to, to be able to succeed in the program. But we do recommend studying chemistry as well. And if you are interested in medicine, um, we assume that you would be taking the, the sort of STEM related subjects in high school, because if you enjoy that, you'll enjoy the medicine study content. Um, but I just wanted to ask um, Ani, what did you study in high school? What subjects? Yeah, so I did the Singapore A-level curriculum. So I studied um, mathematics, chemistry, biology, um, economics, as well as the mandatory English, which is GP. So I would say personally for me, it was a person like a pretty standard um, subject choice combination. Yeah. Yeah, great. And for any students who don't have that level, mm. we do offer bridging courses Absolutely. and it's always an option. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, great I have teaching. plenty of friends who did um, physics or choose other sort of arts subjects and they were able to like perform exceptionally well in the program just because of the bridging courses that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah great. All right, so we're running short on time. Um, so I think I'll finish off with one question to each of you. Um, and that is, what's the best piece of advice you would give to everyone watching here tonight? Um, we'll start with you, Sarah, and then we'll go along. Um, I think that studying overseas is a um, very courageous step to take. Um, I highly recommend you to reflect on your reasons of studying medicine and studying overseas. And I, um, I encourage you to explore, um, be open-minded and you meet more people and you'll find your family here and you'll make the best experience, make the most out of your experience here in Sydney or in Australia or wherever you choose to study. Funny. Yeah, so a lot of similar themes from what Sarah mentioned. I think it's really important in this phase when you're getting ready to interviews, when you're sitting for like ISAT or UCAT, it's easy to get lost, but it's really important to consider um, whether medicine is right for you. A lot of the times we get met, and like confused with the question of whether we are right for medicine, but it's important for you to take a breather and consider whether um, you want to go down this really long yet rewarding road. And you have to really, um, you have to really consider it and go for a lot of sort of um, put yourself in different situations where you can experience it and really answer the question whether you, um, medicine is right for you. Yeah. Okay, and Sean. Yeah, look, I couldn't really add much more to that. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you do it because you love, love it and you're motivated to do it, not because someone else has told you to do it or you've always thought you should do it. And along with what Sarah said, it's challenging. And the challenges are perhaps even more if you're moving from family and coming here, but there's, as we mentioned before, sometimes you don't pass an exam. There's those academic challenges, the social challenges, there's ongoing challenges as you're working and as you're learning. But if you are open to those challenges and embrace it, the reward is is so much, so much more outweighs any of the negatives. Um, so it's a long path. And of course, if your love is healthcare, if you want to get into healthcare and for whatever reason medicine doesn't open up for you, there are the other options. We will be working with doctors, the physiotherapists, the nutritionists, the, um, the pharmacists, optometrists, all these people were helping Sarah's grandfather post-stroke, I'm sure. It's yeah. not just the doctors, the nurses. Yeah. Fabulous. All three really great pieces of advice, um, which I hope has been helpful for you all. So that's all the time we have for now. I'll pass back to Lena to close the event. That's all we have time for, but I really do encourage you to keep the conversation going with us. If you can, come along to our open day on Saturday the 7th of September. And like I said, get in touch with our future student advisors. I would like to give a big thank you to Sean, 
Sarah, Ani, Janice, Kelly and Sarup. You've all added so much insight for the people who joined us tonight. And finally, thank you for joining us. We all wish you the very best finishing off your studies this year, all the best for your applications, and hopefully we'll be seeing you on campus soon enough.